Hi, good evening and welcome to the daily Rambam Shur, three chapters per day. Once upon a time, Rabbi Steinzatz, Shabbos day, he was walking on the streets of Jerusalem and he met his friend, he was a professor in one of the universities in Israel. He was very happy to see him and he was asking, where are you heading? He says, I'm just heading to Shul. And where are you heading? He says, I'm heading right now to the beach. And he says, and after the beach, what is your plans? He says, I'm about to go. There is one and only restaurant in Jerusalem that they sell shrimps. I'm going right now to celebrate and to mark the Shabbos by eating shrimps with my family. He says, and what have you done yesterday? He says, yesterday I went, there is also a very special restaurant that sells only treif. And I went there together with my family. And then Rabbi Steinzatz turns to him, he says, you're doing it every day or you're doing it only on Shabbos? He says, I'm doing it only on Shabbos. He says, wow, I envy you. He says, you, Rabbi, envy me? He says, yes. He says, and I'm going to explain you why. Says, Rabbi Shenzat tells him, I've been observant, religious for a while. And at the beginning, I was very excited about observing Judaism and mitzvot, but as more you're getting used to it, the excitement sort of slows down, becomes status quo. However, by you, I see that you are excited about to mark your way, not necessarily the Torah way, but to mark the Shabbos each and every week with a renewed excitement. You're going to, especially only on Shabbos, to a beach, only on Shabbos to a restaurant. He says, I'm not envying you about the way you are chose to go and mark the Shabbos. I envy you about your emotional, about you drive, the excitement that you have while you're doing the items that you're doing. You know, there is something that we can learn from each and every person, and especially when it comes to the idea of honoring the Shabbos. And the reason that I'm saying it, because today we are finally concluding the rules of Shabbos, Hilchois Shabbos of the Rambam, and he chose to dedicate the last chapter of the Rambam to four items, two of them biblical and the other two are rabbinical. The two biblical, everybody knows, Zachor Veshamo. It is mentioned in the Ten Commandments. But then there is two rabbinicals. It's called Kavod Shabbat, the honor of Shabbat, and Oneg Shabbat, and the pleasure of Shabbat. What is the Kavod of Shabbat? He gives a few examples. A person on the eve of Shabbos, he takes a hot bath. This is the honor of Shabbat. A person in the eve of Shabbos, he is not making a special feast in order to honor the Shabbos by entering the Shabbos, not with a full stomach. If a person takes a huge feast on the eve of Shabbos, on Elif Shabbos, then he's no, not gonna have lots of appetite to go and benefit and enjoy the Shabbos meal. For that reason, part of the honor of Shabbos is not to be a kovea, a big seuda in the morning and not kovea even a normal seuda after the time of minchak tana, which is the 10th hour of the day. So from about 3.30, 4 o'clock, it is part of the honor of Shabbat, of kavod Shabbat, also not to have a kviut seuda. To ameha, to taste from every dish, yes, but to have a kviut seuda in the afternoon, no. Also part of the honor of Shabbat. Another 
the way a person honors the Shabbat by having a special garment. Even if a person has only one garment, at least he should wear it Beshinui. If throughout the week he wears the garment internally, Shabbos he should wear it externally. There is even a story about the Rebbe, the Alter Rebbe, when he was poor and he was imprisoned. So he had only one garment and the way he was wearing the garment on Shabbat is by removing a few threads of the garment in order to display a new, a different garment for Shabbat. So again, part of the way we honor Shabbat, the idea of a different garment, a new garment. There is even a story that once upon a time I heard from my father, Oliver Shalom, about a poor man who came to a town, came to the shul, nobody paid attention to him, nobody greeted him, no one even called him to the Torah. He decided after a few weeks to go and appear to the same shul with a very, very nice type of clothes, with a beautiful fur hat and a very impressive appearance. And then he is being asked by the Gabai of the shul, please tell me your name, I would like to call you to the Torah. He says, no problem, my name is Fotter ben Hittel. He didn't, hey, you repeat the name, Fotter ben Hittel? And then he says, what type of name is it? Fur, the son of a hat? He says, very simple. As a man, I've been here two weeks ago, three weeks ago, four weeks ago. I'm the same man who came today. The only thing that was changed over here is the fact that I'm wearing a fur coat with a hat. For that reason, when you ask me, how am I called? I says, fur, the son of a hat, because that's the only thing that have changed over here and triggered your attention. So that was his message in order to tell them that you should view a person not based on what he wears, but what he is. But nevertheless, there is a term in the Talmud that the garment of a person makes him honorable. Manei mechabdutei. Mane, the dress of a person, makes him honorable. For that reason, a person on Shabbat wears different type of garments. So this is the idea of Kavod Shabbat. What is Oneg Shabbat? Oneg, make the, give, have pleasure on Shabbat. So there is four, five examples of what pleasure of Shabbat is. First, first of all, the quality of the meat a person should buy should be a higher quality, should be fat meat. A person who can, who is able to afford, he should upgrade the level of the food, both quantitatively and qualitatively. However, if a person, it is hard for him, excessive food makes him suffer, so he's forbidden if, for example, there is even further than this, there is a very interesting ruling. If a person, God forbid, had a terrible dream on Shabbat, and part of the way to treat a terrible, cure a terrible dream is by fasting. So the rule is a person should fast on Shabbat and he should fast on Sunday in order to atone for the sin that he was fasting on Shabbat. It reminds me of an interesting story that once upon a time, the Alter Rebbe, his opponents came to him with criticism. And the criticism they presented, how come he lets his Hasidim to go to him and while they are traveling, they are, they cannot study Torah. It is, they violating what they called Bitul Torah, by not being occupied throughout the time of traveling with Torah, they are in a state of a crime. So he says, you're right, while they are traveling, they're not studying, they're not able to study Torah, 
But when they will come back, they will do teshuva. They will return, they will atone for their sin and they'll do what necessary in order to repair it. So they asked him, what type of a solution is? Why do you encourage them to travel to you? And at a time, they won't be able to study and then they'll have to do tshuva in order to atone. Tell them not to go to you. They're not gonna be in trouble to begin with. They won't need a solution in order to solve the problem that was caused at the first place. So he said to them, well, there is a rule in the rules of Shabbat. If a person had a terrible dream on Shabbat, he must fast. And he's in trouble because he fasted on Shabbat. So he will fast on Sunday in order to atone for the fast that he was sinning by fasting on Shabbat. So the question is, why do he need to fast on Shabbat and then fast again on Sunday in order to atone for the sin that he was fasting on Shabbat? He shouldn't fast at the first place and therefore he won't need a second fast in order to atone for it. But what do you see? That when a person is in pain, when a person is in trouble, he must take the necessary step to solve the problem that bothers him here and now. Later, we'll deal with it. For that reason, we see a very interesting halakha, that if, though generally a person is commanded to practice pleasure on Shabbat, and part of pleasure is to have very fancy, tasty, and pleasurable meals. However, if those meals are making him suffer, are torturing him, and his pleasure is by fasting, he should fast. Another idea, how do I observe the pleasure of Shabbat, is by restricting a person to travel more than 40 kilometer distance from his place in order for him not to surprise his family and finding them unprepared for him to have the meal. So for example, it is forbidden for an individual to travel a distance more than 40 kilometers. Obviously, this rule was given them when the means of transportation were not as developed, but at least the principle of not to take so-called closed calls when it comes to transportation and traveling of Shabbat should definitely should be taken in consideration when a person plans his itinerary of traveling and so forth. There is another rule for a army not to start a optional war three days before Shabbat because then the people who are the members of the military won't be able to practice the pleasure of Shabbat. Part of the pleasure of Shabbat is for a person to engage the most ideal time to engage in intimate relationships is also part of uh, Oneg Shabbat and this is the idea why Talmidei Chachamim, their time when they are fulfilling their commitments to their intimate commitments is also on the nights of Shabbat, of Friday night, part of the Oneg Shabbat. The great reward for an individual who is contributing to the pleasure of Shabbat is being said in the words of our prophet as tit anag al hashem you are gonna have pleasure from god vehir kavticha and i will take you al bomote aretz on the heights of the earth veha achalticha nachalat yakov avicha i will feed you the property the inheritance of yakov your forefather kipi hashem dibel this is a prayer that we recite every Shabbos morning that but these are the words the final words that the Rambam concludes Hilchot Shabbat there is 30 chapters and the conclusion of the 30th chapter is with the great reward a person will reap 
for not only observing the Shabbat, not only for remembering the Shabbat, but also for honoring the Shabbat and me'aneget Shabbat and giving in pleasure to the Shabbat. Chazal are saying that all the livelihood of a person is destined on the day of Rosh Hashanah. However, there is one exception. The expenses a person spends for the Shabbos and the tuition he pays for the education of his children. Those expenses are outside the budget that is being decreed, being destined to a person on the day of Rosh Hashanah. This is God's credit cards. Kol ha-mosif, mosifim lo. If a person spends more on the expenses of Shabbat, God will provide him, will pay him, will reimburse him for it fully. This is one of the ways for demonstrating and displaying a leap of faith. The second part of the Shio of today is the beginning of the rules of Eruvin. Everybody heard the word Eruv, but the news that the reference to Eruv that is being loosely used by the crowds is not that type of Eruv that the Rambam is talking about. And I'm going to explain. The Eruv that everybody is referring to consists of two parts. The one part that everybody talks about is not really halachic Eruv. It's a linguistic reference to the word Eruv. The second part that the Rambam is speaking about is the halachic term of Eruv, which many people are not familiar with. But now I'm going to give a little introduction in order to explain what the Rambam is saying. As we have learned, the 39th Melacha, forbidden biblical activity that the Rambam counts amongst the forbidden biblical activity, is the Hotza'a, is the moving objects, Mirashut from one domain, Lirashut to another domain. Biblically, there is only two domains. There is Rashut Harabim, public domain, and then there is a Rashut Hayachid. The movement of objects, stretching of object, throwing of object from one domain to another domain, it is forbidden biblically, and as we have covered before, there is a liability for it. The question, what severity of liability a person carries when he's violating this activity on Shabbat. So what is the solution? When people are living in a village, a town, metropolitan, and they wanted to move objects freely, the only solution is to turn the entire city to a private domain biblically. What is the, how it's being done? It can be done via a few ways. There is one way to do it, by having a fence with a door that will be able to open and close. So when you have an entire fence that surrounding the entire town, city or metropolitan with a gate, with a proper door, you have a perfect private domain. There is some other alternatives, not necessarily with a proper door. It can be done by having poles in a certain size and on top of them you'll have a string and it will create what they call tsuat hapetach, a shape of a door. And it will also going to be acceptable as a legit type of fence. There is another way, if it is a alley, that there is a kora, a brick on top, 
or Alechi is a sign which again with a certain size and measurement and shape all those devices all those solutions will be halochically acceptable to turn this area whether a small area or whether a big area into a biblically acceptable Rashut Hayachid. And that's what everybody is referring to the term Eruv. But that's not enough. Why is it not enough? Again, biblically it is enough. But at the time of Shlomo HaMelech, he introduced that even though Biblically, an entire city can be viewed as a Rashut Hayachid, given the fact that each and every resident of the town has his own apartment, his own house, his own unit, where he is the only legit owner with accessibility to this area, and yet each and every, let's go in our apartment building, there are specific units that there is, belong to an individual, and yet there is a common area that everybody is legally can use, like the lobby, the party room, the corridors. They are common areas that for everybody, there is no Transpass, there is no transpassing into those areas. If someone foreign comes to your apartment, you can arrest him for transpassing. But if uh, in the common area, there is no, no problem whatsoever. So Shlomo HaMelech, by being concerned for a future confusion which may lead the future generation to violate biblical restriction. Because people will think, hey, here people are able to take items from their private apartment into the common area where everybody is able to use, and then move the object to a common area that is designated only to the residents of this apartment building into the street which is available to everybody. They will say, well, if this is the case, so we can move from this street which is available to everybody into the marketplace which is in, available to the entire world. So the distinction between Rashut Hayachid biblically and Rashut Harabim biblically will be forgotten. And therefore, it will be violation of the Melechet Hotza'ah, of the activity, forbidden activity of moving objects from one domain to the other, which is a biblical restricted activity. For that reason, in order to prevent the consequences that can come out from such a mistake, he introduced the concept of Eruv Chatzeirot. And I'm going to explain, translating the word Eruv is a mixture. Chatzeirot is a yard. Yard is exactly like today a lobby. A yard is a common area where some houses are using. Today is a very common in uh, what they call in units of townhomes, condominiums, not necessarily condominium buildings, but there is townhomes where they have uh, it's like condominium corporations where, they, again, they're using a common area. So how it's being done, how they all becoming mixed into one unit. The original way to do it, each and every member of this cooperation contributes a certain amount of food. Ideally, bread. Ideally, 
it should be a full bread, not a sliced bread, but a whole bread. As a minimum measurement of each and every household for one grogeret. Now, they are all, each and every member of the condominium, he gives this amount and then they are all being placed into one bag and this bag is being placed in one of the apartments or one of the units of the common area. By doing so, there is a blessing that is being recited and the declaration is that all the members of the place, they are becoming one family and by doing so, it will engrave in their memory, in their consciousness, the idea of the distinction between Rashut Yachid and Rashut Rabim, and the only legitimacy they are able to carry from the houses to the yards, from the yard to the houses, is only thanks to the Eruv. And without the Eruv, they are in trouble. So Eruv, in the halachic term, is the contribution of the bread or any other item into a communal bag in order to redefine their relationship as one unit. They are becoming like a kolkhoz, like a family, like a unit, a singular unit, and this is the only way that will allow them rabbinically to carry from their houses to the common area, or from the common area to the house. This was introduced by Shlomo HaMelech. And the Gemara tells us that when Shlomo HaMelech introduced this idea and this solution, Batkol, a echo from heaven, came and praised him. If my son is so smart, my heart is quelling, is rejoicing from Naches for you introducing this great idea, this great solution. So now you will ask me, is it, that's what's going on? I mean, I don't remember that some of us contributed lately a lachmania, a piece of bread or a matzah or anything to the communal bag. How come we are still allowed to carry? So part of the ways is not necessarily that each and every one can give. There is a principle in Judaism called Zachin Le'adam. I am able to provide a merit to do a privilege, a positive gift to someone without his knowledge. When I'm about to assign a zchut, a zchut is a merit, a positive, a plus, a surplus to an individual, I don't have to inform from him because the assumption that everybody would love to be zocheh, zocheh is to gain. When it comes to provide gain to an individual, I don't need his consent. And for that reason, the, a third party is legally allowed to be mezake, to appoint an individual as a proxy, that he will be the one who is contributing the bread on behalf of the entire apartment building, neighborhood, city, or metropolitan. So that way, even a huge city after having a step number one, assuring that biblically they are a shut hayachid by having the proper fence or actual fence or alternative fence which are legitimately acceptable as proper mechitzot, then the contribution of the mutual bread or other feasts are taking place and that's how the idea of Eruvei Chatzerot are taking place. So, 
it's easy. So this is the principle of what we call Eruvin in general. In the second chapter, the Rambam illustrates and deals with scenarios what happened if an individual forgot to participate with the Eruv by contributing a bread. No third party proxy was appointing someone on behalf of everybody and yet there are members who are relying on individual contributions of bread and someone of the members of the building or the common area was not contributing. So as long as he is not willing to make a bitul, a nullification, it's sort of like gifting away or giving away or removing his own ownership from his property. He is restricting upon them the movements of objects from their apartments to the common area and so on. So the Rambam deals with situations where a person is in neighborhood with a non-Jewish person. He is the singular residence in a non-Jewish building. Such an individual has no problem to go and carry. The problem begins when there is more than one Jew resides in a building where non-Jewish people are there. So the only solution for them to carry is actually to rent can be a symbolic rent or permission taking from the non-Jew to use their facilities. There is also different uh, scenarios that some people receive, obtain ownership in middle of the Shabbos of a certain property. Do I need their action? whether by nullifying their own, dom their own property for the roof or I can rely upon the previous owner. So all those type of uh, situations and scenarios are being presented in the, today's Rambam when it comes to Eruvin. There is a very interesting, I guess there is a story that is being told about when Yaakov Avinu was on the way to Choron, he stopped in Bet El. And when he realized what went on over there, he says, Man hamakom aze, How scary is this place? Ain ze ki im Bet Elokim. It must be a house of worship. So I heard once of the interpretation that when Yaakov Avinu realized, it says that the stones were fighting amongst them, who will be the stone, the lucky stone, that Yaakov Avinu will place his head over the stone. One stone what says, I will be the lucky one. The other one says, I will be the lucky one. So then Yaakov Avinu made them all one stone. So everybody agreed. Yaakov Avinu saw he comes to a place that even stones are fighting with each other about religious affairs, about who will be the lucky one, the lucky stone that Yaakov, the tzaddik, will place the head over the stone. When he saw over here, there is fighting, politics, conflicts, even with stones about religious affairs, he knew this must be a place of worship. Why am I saying it? Because historically, the concept of Eruvin in general, in many communities, were basically, I would say, Sela Machloket. Sela is a stone of arguments, debate, conflict, politics, and so on. There is even a vote that many of the Darshanim used to say 
It says, Habi me'at rega ad yavo za'am. Hide for a moment until the anger will disappear. Za'am in Hebrew is anger, furious. But za'am in Hebrew is also abbreviation of those three words. Zayin stands for zvachim, when shechita. I instead for eruvin and mem for mikvaot. In every community, and you can follow the different literature of responsa and pashkvils and so on, those three issues of zvachim, eruvin, and mikvaot provided material for so many conflicts and so much Agree, a disagreement and arguments and so on but obviously they are very important because again something that is being fought obviously it's worth fighting for at least that's what people are thinking but for that reason it's very important to make a order at least on the concepts on the principles of Eruvin and so on which will try to dwell more in details in the upcoming days. Um, that's all. Thank you very much and Shabbat Shalom and all the best.